Roberto, when was the last time that you cried that you can remember? <laughs> Why are you asking me that? Um, last time that I cried was probably at a movie recently. Okay. Um, Do you cry in movies one? very often? I'm more and more as I get, as I've gotten older. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But I'm trying to remember what the last movie I saw that I would have cried in. Certainly not the shape of, uh, uh, sorry, I fell asleep there for a minute. Water. Um, I've gotten into so many debates about the shape of water recently. Uh, I, I, let's see what movie, did, what was a big movie recently that yeah. was like impactful? I don't know what movies you've seen recently. No, like, like, you know, last three months, let's say. Big. I don't know. This is a boring conversation. All right. Well, I so, cry in movies. Okay. So that's what I want to talk about because someone wrote in about that. And also I want to talk about uh, sexual predators and how YouTube is using videos to humiliate some of them. Oh, I know which movie I cried in. Yeah. I was, I was watching, re-watching The Karate Kid. <laughs> the old Karate Kid. Yeah, the original. You cried at the end. I cried actually when, when Mr. Miyagi slaps his hands together to heal his knee at the oh, end. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, this is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. My name is Humberto Castaneda. I counsel grieving celebrities. So this is an email from patron Travis. He writes, you have before mentioned your crusade to start crying again in your 20s. Uh, he's referring to the fact that I didn't cry when I was right. a teenager because Remember I didn't want to. And then I, it was hard for me to cry. And so in my 20s, I uh, went on a campaign. I think he means campaign, not crusade. <laughs> I wouldn't go on a crusade to, to cry, but uh, to start crying again. And it worked. And he goes on, I would be very interested to know how you approached that issue back then. I'm asking because I'm a 27-year-old male and have not cried once since I was 10 years old. What? Sometimes when I experience a lot of pain inside, I will feel like crying, but I am never able to do so even if I try. I feel like it would be both relieving and healthy for me to be able to cry at least once in a while, but I just don't know how to allow myself to do so. For example, one of my childhood friends died in a car crash a couple months ago, which made me very sad. I think about him almost every day, but I still have not been able to shed one tear about it. Wow. I know you will probably bring up how we as men are socialized not to cry, and while that might be true, I am consciously aware of this. I still don't know how, I still don't know what to do about it. It is like something in me just won't allow me to cry no matter how bad I feel. As a side note, I would also like to request more Umberto in your episodes. <laughs> that made me cry. What if I cry all the time? So, Berto, what, what advice do we have for Paige and Travis about how he can start crying again? Hey, no, I can relate. So, you know, I, I, as a kid, I cried, I'm sure, plenty. <laughs> um, but there was a point somewhere in my teenage years, maybe, or, or even younger, I don't know. I, I definitely remember uh, both internalizing that, like, okay, I'm not supposed to cry. And I, I remember my dad getting super mad at me if I would start crying. Hmm. You know, like, stop crying. You know, like, he'd get really, he'd yell, he'd get really angry. So at one point, I stopped crying. And I basically took it to heart. Um, so no, I would not have cried at a movie. I would not have cried if sad. Like I moved from Colombia, left all my friends and family behind. I didn't shed a tear. How did you start crying again though? So I think, I, I wish I could pinpoint exactly, but I will say that um, there were a couple of things that, that made me cry. One of them was uh, um, when I was really drunk one time. And I had this breakdown about my mother. And I just started wailing uncontrollably like a little baby. And I don't mean like a baby. I mean, literally like a baby. You cries. regressed. You regressed. Totally. And so uh, do you think that all that pain that you maybe even kind of focused on in that moment and maybe with the added alcohol uh you know lack of you know mm -hmm. inhibitions that broke the dam and then after that you could start crying again i feel that that's the case now i'm not gonna guarantee like i'd never cried before i definitely don't remember instances like yeah i would cry here or there i don't remember instances as far as if you would have asked me do you cry i've been like no do you cry that's weird who cries? You know, adults don't cry. Right. Uh, but I can't guarantee it. But I do know for a fact 
that that felt cathartic. And after that, and it wasn't like immediately like the next day, I'm just like in tears at all times. But I remember after that, it like being at movies and be like, <laughs> you know, like crying. And like, I started crying a lot more around that after that event. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I could see that working for some people, but it wasn't on purpose. It's just something that happened. Right. Interesting. Um, uh, I well f- so yeah for me I cried I think normally up until I was in the 6th grade and I was in uh we were we were doing a field day and we were playing uh we were actually playing I think softball and the guy in front of me as he hit the ball so this is at school and I'm with my classmates he hits the ball and instead of just dropping the bat he flung the bat back towards the dugout and I was just standing, I was next up on, I was, you know, on deck and the, I could just see the bat like swinging in the air as it's, as it's flying towards me. And I was, and I just knew there was no way I was going to get out of the way. And it was like, it was going to hit me. Yeah. And it was a aluminum bat. Ouch. And it hit me in the legs and from my memory, it didn't really hurt, but it was, but it was so scary that I started to cry. Which grade again? Sixth grade. Okay. Sixth grade. So I, or fifth or sixth grade, I'm not sure. And so I went, I, I like walked off the field cause I'm crying now. Yeah. <laughs> and I, and I go sit up on this little hill, this little grassy hill and a couple girls came with me and they're sitting next to me and they're like trying to console me, <laughs> you know, they're like, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. And, and all I can think is this is humiliating. Oh my gosh, my social life is over. <laughs> and it didn't even hurt. Right. And I play baseball. <laughs> you know, like I've I've been hit <laughs> with balls and you know in the head. I've been right. hit with bats. I I you know I've right. I've had I I was catcher. Like people would run into me all the time and right. I wouldn't cry then, but there was something about it happening at school or something. I don't know. So there's some weird and I, and the other thing I'm thinking is like I wouldn't mind crying in front of my teammates, but at school in front of all these girls, like it's just, uh. it's just humiliating. And so after that, I went on a campaign to stop crying. And whenever oh, I on a felt, crusade, <laughs> yeah, whenever I yeah I, I like invaded uh, Israel and started. <laughs> you know. And so I uh, w- when I felt that initial tear reflex, I would get angry. Oh. And I would actually make an angry face. Mm. I'd go like, okay. I'd be like, no, I'm not going to cry. Urgh! And then over time, do you rinse and repeat that over you didn't a few do it. Yeah, yeah, a few years. And after, you know, a while, I noticed that I couldn't cry even if I wanted to. Right, you just wouldn't cry. Like it just yeah. it was a it was a neuronal thing that yeah. had, that just was gone. I can totally relate to that. Yeah. And and I was happy about it. I was like, "Yay, I succeeded!" Yeah, in, I don't cry. Yeah, my campaign, my crusade worked. Fast forward to graduate school. I'm 24 years old, and I'm wa- and I'm in class at Antioch, and there's occasional crying that's happening. And it, but meanwhile, I'm never crying because uh, it. Whenever you're going to school in graduate school for psychology for to become a therapist, there's going to be some personal moments and some some crying. And there were times when I just, I felt completely out of place because mm. I wasn't crying. And I thought I should, and I also felt like I needed to be more healthy and, and there was something wrong with the fact that I wasn't crying, you know, similar to how patron Travis is talking about. And so the technique I used Travis was when I thought I was in a moment where I might cry which I didn't actually know initially. Mm-hmm. It was hard to hard to know, but I would feel like, oh, I think this is one of those moments where this I... This is when pe- normal people cry. <laughs> yeah. And I would actually physically try to... In a, it's hard to explain, but I would actually physically try to shoot tears out of my eyes. <laughs> like, like, you know how some people can like wiggle their ears or they can, right, or they can right. w- wiggle their nostrils? Sure. Neither of which I could do, but... <laughs> Neither can I, but they involve muscles that if you spend enough time trying to manipulate, you, you can, might be able you to can yeah. do it. Well, I think that's what I did with crying. I think like <laughs> I just, I kind of like, there's like, there's probably some muscles of, of that are involved in tear yeah, yeah. production or something. And then, or I would just, there's a certain face you make when you cry too. So I'd sort yeah. of make that face. I'd be like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to cry now. I'm like, yeah. you know, you scrunch up your face. 
And I did that, I don't know, 50 to 100 times maybe. Yeah. And, and eventually like... It worked. One tear came out. And then the next time, you know, really tried to force it again. And now when I did have a couple of tears, yeah. then I would try to capitalize on it. Yeah. And then I started learning what made me cry. Uh. And often it's movies, you know, <laughs> uh, like uh, just fast forward a few years after that, I was seeing Mulan, <laughs> the Disney movie, and it's about Asians. Yeah. And I was just so happy to see Asians in a Disney movie that it just... It made me cry, even though it's not really sad. There's right. just there's just so many moments of like joy for me. It's, it's right. basically I was like half half. I'm crying half of the movie. I'm not even joking. It was half the movie. Like I every scene would make me cry because I was so joyful right. to see Asians in a movie, even though they're not even Japanese people, you know. So wow. so that's what I did, and, and then after that, uh, it's just been like. I can just coast. You can it. just do it. And now, like, there are times when it's inconvenient how easy <laughs> it is for me to cry. I, I think I went too far. Oh no! Yeah, like, like at the end of Black Klansman, for example, it's I, I'm just so moved by the the story, the story, and, yeah. and the heroism, and the the plight, and the hopelessness, and right. and the the unfair treatment that really everyone has been through black people, you know, very much so, but really all of us, ha we've just all been through some really terrible things unfairly. And that, that all hit me at the, you know, towards the end of that movie. And I, the, the crying that I was, that I had in that moment was <laughs> in the blubbering stage. Oh no. <laughs> and, <laughs> Uh, like, un, like leaving the theater, yeah, yeah. getting in my car, yeah. you know, waves of, waves of, of, yeah. of pain of, oh, man. of like, the, <laughs> well, so I'm trying not to, I, I let you get away the little jokey about crying, but you know, that plays into the whole stereotype. <laughs> You know, you called yourself baby earlier, which, and then I was like, well, should I? Pass? I meant literally like yeah, a baby. You, yeah. So you, you mean you, you regressed, but yeah. we, I think, okay, we can get our little, you know, jokes out at the beginning, but I think, you know, we need to stop making fun of masculine crying, which men will do. You know, women, women do that too, but men really do it. You know, men will be like, oh man, I was crying like a little girl. Right. And it's like, no, you were crying like a grown fucking man. Because grown fucking men cry. Why would grown fucking men not cry? Because Clint Eastwood. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, my God, you know, when I think about all the messages, both in media and in my personal life, like, I was just trying to think if as a child, I ever saw a grown man cry. And I don't, I can't remember. Like, I can't remember seeing... Uh, the, uh, what's his name? The guy who died very young, uh... You know, Jim, Jim, James Dean. I never watched James Dean movies when I was That's a kid. your problem. You never saw a man cry. <laughs> are you talking about, um, are you talking about Rebel Without a Cause? I, I don't, probably both. I, I don't remember which one, but he's, it breaks down in tears, man. I really don't understand why people like that movie. I mean, I get, I would understand back then because of the, the, the sort of reality of some of his acting. Mm. But have you watched that movie recently? No, it's been a long time. Oh, it is. Uh, I mean, I guess as, as a, there's some movies like, like Casablanca, it still is a good movie. Like you could still watch it. Right. And you're like, okay, I, yeah, I like this movie, you know? I mean, if you think about like Luke Skywalker runs into his charred aunt and uncle and he sat, sits there and I think maybe one little tear slips down. Right. You know what I mean? Exactly. And this is a little whiny teenager, Luke Skywalker. Right. <laughs> right. So, um, so many messages. I mean, part of me wishes, and maybe there is out there, of like, just catalog all of the harmful masculine messages that were just in movies and TV of the 70s. You know, just like, there, there's just, it, 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 they're easy to find, you know? And, um, like when women would be scared, they would just be like, ah, you know, and the man would grab the woman, you know, yeah, it's just yeah. like a classic movie scene. I mean, that's like a trope, totally. right? The woman, 
scream. She's hysterical. And the man is like, I'm there to protect. I'm, I'm concerned, but I'm there, you know? Yeah. And it's, it just reverse it. It's just, yeah, totally. It's just a brutish history that, you know, the universe is a brutish place and you can, it's just hard to imagine that it would have felt like the right strategy for a Roman legion to be like, all right, uh, you guys, you know, if you get a little hurt during the battle, feel free to let it all out. We'll be, you know, no, instead it would have been like, who's the toughest? Who's well, going to not show the pain the most? Well, it's, it's hard for us to know, one, about Roman military practices. It's possible, I, I don't know, maybe there's historians that know, that the uh, practice, I mean, definitely toughness and discipline and following the orders was, uh, was privileged. But maybe back at camp, they were allowed to cry about yeah, losing, <laughs> losing their buddies, you know? Yeah. Like, it's so, it, it's hard to know exactly. And that's sort of like, I think compartmentalizing is, is not new. That part's not new. You know, like, uh, there's all sorts of funeral uh, sort of traditions where, okay, during the funeral, we're all going to scream and wail and dance wildly, and, but not after the funeral or before the funeral. You see what I'm saying? Like that is not uncommon throughout cultures. And, and yet it's in, out of context, it's still not okay for you to sit there and wail and cry. But oh, at the funeral, you better be loud. In fact, in fact, you're not loud, we're gonna think you didn't care enough. And so right, yeah. the compartmentalizing is not new, but actually freely expressing oneself, that's historically been hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and the whole thing about crying in our culture is just so weird. I mean, you know, the fact that men like us have to make a joke about us crying, you know, it's just like, why is it funny? Right, Who right. cares? Um, or that um, uh, people are off put by other people crying. You right. know, like if, if you see, you're in, you're in the grocery store and there's a, there's a girl in the middle of the, you know, the bread aisle and she's just sobbing into her Wonder Bread. Uh, right. that's, a, that's a very upsetting scene for people. Right. But if she were smiling and looking at her phone, uh, then it's like, oh, it's fine. But there's right. something very, very upsetting about uh, crying. And, and, and I actually have to, uh, it, it, it always, it surprises me and doesn't surprise me. But every new batch of supervisees and students that I have, I, I have to slowly acclimate them to, to people crying. Yeah. They'll, they'll be just be like, you know, so, you know, she was crying and I didn't know what to do. And I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> you know, well, I didn't know what to do. And I was like, there's nothing to do. What, what's the goal? Well, I didn't know how to like get her to stop crying. And I'm like, why would you want her to stop yeah. crying? Who cares? What's the, what, when did tears ever hurt anybody? Yeah. You know? I think one of the other things is as a natural part of growing up, uh, there is an age past which it, you're certainly not expected or supported to cry over minor things. So, you know, the little uh, seven-year-old knocks their legs against the table and is in desperate tears. And you're like, oh, that sucks. Uh, but, you know, the 12-year-old does that. And you're like, come on, stop. They just bumped your toe. But why? Well, well, there is a useful part of that, right? Like if you imagine if we never were if we never grew out of the phase where any minor inconvenience sets us off in major tears, Why? it'd be a, well, it'd be a terrible place to live. Why? Because I think it's you're yelling at me. Right? It'd be anything would trigger us at all times because babies are like that, right? A baby cries because the, the but, thing fell to the ground. That's not what I'm, that's not what we're talking about. Well, we're not, we're not talking about losing our minds. We're no, no, talking, but, we're talking and we're not talking about, we're not even talking about complaining. No, we're, but we're I'm talking make, about tears coming out of our eyes. I know, but I'm making a point that as a, in my mind, necessary part of growing up, you have you you are taught that, and you see around you. Okay, people don't always cry for everything. Okay, I guess I won't cry. But I think in that process, there is no conversation or replacement of okay. But there are contexts where crying is healthy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and so and, yeah. Well, let me let me yeah. provide some nuance. I don't know exactly if you're disagreeing with this or not, but the. Um, I consider it throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So you have a kid who is five years old and doesn't want to go to bed at their bedtime. Right. And so they are crying and maybe they're not, uh, maybe the tears are manipulative, but maybe not. Let's just say, let's say right. they're legitimate tears. The kid is like really <laughs> bummed out and sad. 
that they have to go to bed and miss out on watching TV with their older siblings. And they, they're, they're not only, tears are coming out of their face, but not only that, but they're also like refusing to go to bed. Right. Like, no, I don't want to, I don't want to go to bed. I don't want to go to bed. You can't make me, fuck you. You know, whatever yeah. they say. Well, parents legitimately and functionally look at that as a problematic behavior because you can't have kids uh, just um, not being able to uh, follow rules and right. not have a routine and um, not be able to adjust to situations and so and not be able to self-soothe also. And so the parents will say, stop crying. Because in that moment, they're, what they're really saying is, suck it up, you're going to bed. Right. Knock it off. Stop right. throwing a fit. You know, you're working yourself up is the thing. Right. You know, you're you're basing this emotionality on a notion that you have control, kid, and you don't. Or you're basing this emotionality on a notion that this is a terrible thing, and you've been going to bed at eight o'clock every night for the past year. This right. isn't terrible. Like, stop thinking about it as a terrible thing, and you'll stop crying. You know. Right. But what? That's not what they say. What they say is stop crying, go to bed. Okay. And so what we end up doing is we're saying to the kids, you can't cry. Yeah. You know, that, that's my point is okay. my, my point, but it's, it's, it's a two parter. The first one is we have to get past the point where every minor inconvenience sets us off in a trail of hysterics and screaming. Otherwise society couldn't function. Right. But in the process of getting away from that, to your point, we're throwing out the tears with the, right. with the, <laughs> right. So what parents should be doing and maybe, there are parents out there that do, and actually I do know parents out there that do this, is they'll say in that instance, I see that you're crying and I see that you're upset and you're really sad. You're going to miss out on watching TV with right. your older siblings. I get that, but you're still going to bed. Right. And the kid continues to cry and complain. It's like, it, kid, uh, honey, it's okay that you're crying and that you're sad. That's that's normal. It's, it's, it's sad. I get sad when I have to go to bed. Right. And you're also also being stubborn yeah. and unreasonable <laughs> now and you you know you're gonna have to go to bed that's that's the right. way of the world so there's and then the third strike they're off to a convent or a yeah <laughs> uh and so you you know you know you put them in a in a thing of water and you throw them out the door <laughs> um and so the uh uh and you know sexism and associating um tears with femininity and weakness and um, all those things get tied into it as well. And, and so uh, anyway, there's so, another, sorry, there's, there's another aspect to it, which is uh, mushiness. So, so sure, there is the thing about, oh, you're being weak, right? But there's a flip side to it, which is uh, like, oh, don't, don't be so romantic, so mushy. Like, you know, part of the masculinity thing is, right. Uh, don't be so mushy. Right. You know? Right. Like if a man cries at the end of a rom-com, like right. the way I cried at the end of Crazy Rich Asians, even though I didn't like that movie that much. Right. I, uh, yeah, it's like the epitome of femininity right. is to cry at the end of a rom-com. Right. And, and the, during during a wedding scene. You right. Know? And then the guy sitting there stoic, like, what's wrong with you? But the thing that killed me actually, which is actually in line with some of the sexist issues, is that the the wedding you haven't seen crazy rich asians no so the in the wedding it's it's actually not the main characters it's like a different it's like an ancillary character's wedding that mm -hmm. the main characters are going to and the the groom is at the altar and as the bride is coming down the the um you know the aisle which by the way has been flooded with water and and th th this this wedding scene at the end of crazy rich asians is the most, it's like a wedding. It's so great because you could see someone actually paying for a wedding like this, but it's so fantastical. I mean, it is, uh -huh. they, they flood after everyone goes down the aisle, they flood the aisle with water. <laughs> and then she, then the bride walks down by herself and it's it like, looks it's like so she's walking on water or something. Right. Yeah. And, and there's like flower petals yeah. and lily pads and stuff that they've put out. And it, and it doesn't look like a movie set. It looks like the way someone would design this. You Spoiler know? alert! <laughs> and then the 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 people uh, you know in the aisles, the the audience have these like LED flowers, mm -hmm. these like lily flowers that they're sort of draping over the aisle. And it, mm -hmm. I don't know. Anyway, so the groom, he's like 
legitimately like crying, crying. Oh. and I'm, I'm gonna cry thinking about it he's looking at his bride you know and he's just like it, they you know they snap the sh- the camera to him and he's not just like oh here comes my bride i mean he's 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 bawling mm-hmm. and he's this asian good looking guy you know and and you know I, he's it a seems good, surprising well it's sweet it's a very sweet yeah. moment and um anyway so uh yeah all that is like counter to uh traditional masculinity and i am saying the new masculinity involves that because real men are not afraid of crying. They are brave enough to cry and they don't care, right, Bruno? Yep. I agree. And we don't have to call ourselves little girls. We can call ourselves big men who cry. Oh, being a little big man over there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another email relates to this patron Oyvind. Oyvind? Um, from a different country because they have a different O in that country. Um, He's training to become a therapist and he's worried he might cry in front of his clients. And he writes, one of my teachers, a man who's deep into CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, says it's an issue to cry in therapy as a therapist and that it shouldn't happen. But most of my other teachers have a more liberal approach and think that in some cases it can really help because it shows that you are actually involved a client, showing empathy, etc. But of course, there's a time and a place for it. Well, I was just curious what your take is on it. Uh, I will just very briefly say that, yeah, it's fine to cry as a therapist. Uh, It's extremely rare to cry as a therapist and have it be harmful. The only thing is, is you just don't want it to become uh, so um, vulnerable that the client now feels responsible for your feelings. But even that, like, it's not the end of the world, you know? Like, if you're in session and, you know, something really touches a nerve in you, like say uh your say your wife died and you're you're working with a couple and they uh are working really hard and they start expressing real love to each other and it really touches a nerve in you and you and you start to sob right You're, you're a man and you're just like I mean, the tears are coming and you're you know you're sobbing and right. you're, you know it, it's a it's a visceral thing well to a lot of people and including your 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 cbt teacher this is some sort of like horrible thing and it shouldn't happen and uh, the thing is is like in that moment the clients are deeply concerned about you and here's what you say uh i'm really sorry about this i'm gonna go to the bathroom for about five minutes right uh it's it's fine um i'll tell you what just happened when i returned right you go to the bathroom you get yourself together you come and back they out. hear you screaming. <laughs> come back out. You sit down in the chair and you say, I'm terribly sorry. Um, I, seeing the two of you love each other in session reminded me of something in my life that I'm not going to go into, but it just, it just really touched um, a really sensitive nerve for me that um, the two of you are expressing love for each other. And I just really, it, it just really affected me. And I just want to tell you, like, it was a really beautiful thing to see the two of you do that. Right. Okay, problem solved. It's okay. That's the whole yeah. thing. Like you can recover even if you have a disaster, which I've never heard a therapist having. Like yeah. I'm sh- well, maybe I have and I just don't remember it, but those are very rare. I will I, say, let's go ahead. Oh, sorry. I mean, I I'll say the opposite seems actually uh worse for me as a client in the sense of I certainly, you know, I don't want a therapist just breaking out into fits of crying at every session and stuff that would that would feel a little distracting but the flip side is i'm sitting there and i'm maybe some we're talking about something really emotional something traumatic or whatever here's what i don't want i'm not saying i necessarily need them to cry but a complete stoic like tell me more yeah like i i don't want a robot right. therapist right Right. So, so if you tear up a little bit, I mean, has your therapist ever teared up? Yeah. Yeah. Did that bother you? No. Was it good? It felt, a, it felt contextual. Right. It felt validated. Yes. Real. Yes. She's with you. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And so do it. And I do that all the time. I, I, I have this one couple that I see who pretty much every time I see them, they, I tear up a little bit. And if I wanted to sort of encourage the tears, I would start sobbing you know, <laughs> if I wanted to. Um. And because of the love that they express towards each other, it's it, it's a beautiful thing to watch, right? And and it's joyous to see, and it's, it's like watching a wedding, you know. And you just start to tear up a little bit, and I'm sure that they see it. 
and I don't care. What what again? What harm does it do? Right. It, it's okay to cry. It's okay for water to come out of your eyes. It's okay to sob. It's okay to have an emotion. Like I tell my friend, my, not my friends, the, the kids that I work with at, at these camps, emotions are our friends. Right. You do not have to be afraid of emotions. Therapists should all be very comfortable with the fact that we have emotions. <laughs> you cry, and, and really crying is, is the most innocuous one of all. Right. Uh, in terms of like the so-called, you know, uh, destructive emotions or something, right? Uh, getting angry, getting hostile, you know, then we're talking about, you have to rein that in a little bit, but crying, you know, if, or a little teary. Uh, right. Yeah, it's great. And you just say, man, what you're saying is really affecting me. I'm with you on well, this. It's like, imagine the flip side, like, you know, I was in a session with my clients and they said something that happened to them that was really joyous. I got to admit, I broke a smile. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll get into that in a second, actually, and then we'll take a break. But um, so here, here's my final thing on, on the crying thing is, uh, Oyvind, your teacher who says that crying shouldn't happen, he is either an idiot or he's a liar. I don't know which one or both. Um, and he's exhibiting harmful masculinity. Ask him to show you the research that backs up his claim that crying in therapy is somehow not okay. There's no research that supports that claim because that's a ridiculous notion. And I know the research and it doesn't demonstrate that. The opposite is demonstrated by self-disclosing in very um, you know, precise ways and by not making it about you, then you can actually really make powerful moments for the client that really helps them and actually increases that. I mean, self-disclosing, which is crying in therapy, has been shown empirically to improve outcomes all across the board, depression, anxiety, relationship problems, uh, schizophrenia, like everything, all outcomes get better when, when therapists have a better relationship and self-disclosing and crying are a component of that. Now it's, you know, it's subtle and you just have to know what you're doing, but, but yeah. So, it, so you're a teacher who says that uh, crying in therapy shouldn't happen is either uh, wrongheaded, like extremely, or and mistaken, misled, or lying, and you're, uh, you know, I hate instructors who, who, uh, you know, propagate such uh, wrongheadedness, and especially ones who shame emotions. You're a fucking therapist, and you're shaming emotions. Like, what's wrong with you? Uh, okay, if you're a finance manager and you're teaching other finance managers, and you want to say never cry in front of your clients, and you want to shame that, like. Fuck you for doing that, but fine. You're you're in finance. You know you don't. We can't expect you to know that emotions are okay. You're a therapist, goddammit. And like, if you can't understand that crying is okay, then get out of the profession because you're actually harming people. You're spreading not only just lies, but you're also destructively enacting your stupid masculinity on other people. Fireworks it, it drives me nuts. There's there's other silliness that I've heard. That I will try to rein it in for a second, but <laughs> triggered. There, there, there are other things like you know that so a recent one I heard from a student that they had heard from another instructor is never laugh when your client laughs. Wow! Can you can you imagine? I was joking about that just now. That's what I said. I was going to get to it. <laughs> Someone told me that they were told by an instructor that when when you when a when you're sitting with a client and the client laughs about something, you do not laugh ever. Now, I don't know if they got it wrong. It's possible that they didn't understand the nuance of what the instructor was saying. And I get the premise, which is basically like, because some clients will laugh in incongruous moments. Sure. You know? They'll be like, yeah, so, you know, then I was raped. <laughs> yeah, like, ah! Right. As a, right as, as a therapist, you don't laugh at that. No, that's not the point. But if there's a funny thing that happens, yeah. God damn it, and the client laughs, yeah. like, and you just sit there stone-faced, like, what's wrong with you? This, is, this was my, my general point when I talked about my experience in therapy was that uh, I felt that I found someone that felt empathetic to my life. That didn't mean... That, she, you know, because, yeah, the opposite would be just as bad where I go like, you know, and 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 then I fucked up again. It's like, oh, you you're always fucking up. It's like, that's too much. No, right. rain it in. But the, the flip side is a little contextual awareness. And then you as a client feel like, OK, sh this person is paying attention. They, I, I can see they're feeling what I'm feeling. Right. 
like it actually helps in my opinion feel like okay it's a little safer this is a safer zone right of course the extremes would be terrible <laughs> of course yeah. it would or like you know imagine if if i am crying a bit and the, the therapist starts laughing well that's in congress too or they get mad at me because i'm making light of something or yeah. whatever like those are all those are all extremes yeah and i also want to point out that cognitive behavioral therapy benefits when the relationship is going well so it's not like because I'm predicting some people say like, well, in CBT, you know, it's about this and that. And, and I'm here to tell you, empirical research shows that when the relationship is going well in CBT, it, it is much more likely to have good outcomes. And when relationship is bad in CBT, or at least not optimal, the empirical outcomes as, and there's been plenty of studies on this, demonstrate that outcomes are worse. And so even though you're doing the exact same CBT model with the client. Yeah. Exact same CBT model, exact same, you know, approach. And the people with relationships are much better off. And I'm not talking by a slight amount. I'm talking about like by a huge amount. In fact, research shows that the relationship is, I can't remember the exact stats, but something three to five, four times uh, more important to outcomes than the particular model that you use as a therapist. Right. So, so you know, you could throw out CBT and just say, well, today I'm a psychodynamic therapist and that will have less of an effect on the outcomes uh -huh. than if you have a good relationship right. or bad relationship with your client. You know, in some ways, like let's, let's put uh, the therapy on pause for a second. Let's say you're having a conversation with another human being. Uh, you're still looking for the right kind of subtle validation as you're having the conversation. And of course, there's many things that would feel inappropriate. So, if I say something and I'm going like, well, and then, so then I picked up my wallet and then, <laughs> right. Okay. So that, right. Or if I say something and the other person goes, <laughs> or, or, you know, like the kind of like that, like that you, you're feeling judged in that moment. Right. Yeah, so like yeah. it, now you apply it back to a therapy and I'm saying like, well, then I told her, I just didn't know if we could stay together. Yeah. <laughs> like, that, it's like, whoa, what? <laughs> you know, you don't want that. Of course not. Right. But, but it is a big difference when you're having those moments. And like, I, I had these experiences where I come in all proud of something that I'd done, right? I'm like, so you, you'll love this. Like I, uh, I tried the thing we talked about. And so instead it, I had this meeting and instead of like blowing up along with everyone else, I just kind of made a joke to diffuse the situation and, and everything just kind of washed over me and it actually brought the energy level down and it was a much better meeting. And I remember my therapist smiling and being like, good work, you know, right. like good work, encouraging. Right. So I, I don't want her to be like, <laughs> or like, oh God, you've made so much progress. You're growing up so fast. But it's like acknowledging that emotional moment, right? Right. Or stone face. Or, or, or yeah, like, oh, tell yeah. me more. Right. Right. And, and honestly, the, the broader umbrella that I want to say, and I think you're bringing up a lot of good points, Berto. The broader umbrella thing I want to say is that therapy is an extremely subtle interaction between two people. Yeah. It'd be like trying to put into words advice to someone on how to fall in love. It, it is not possible. <laughs> uh, there are guidelines like don't be a dick and listen well and be interesting. <laughs> uh, but how do you put that into operational advice to someone like here's what you do? I don't know. I've seen a lot of videos on YouTube about picking up chicks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so the notion that you could even describe the magic of how therapy works, particularly relational therapy, is silly. And then the notion that you could just set a rule. Right. Like, don't laugh when your clients laugh. Or right. don't cross your legs, which is another one I hear. Oh, really? Yeah or make sure your posture is extremely upright, you know? Huh. Or here's another one I love, which I really don't get. Never ask a client why, or never, why? <laughs> yeah, or never ask a client how they feel. Can you believe that one? Wait, what? Yeah. Okay, that one is the worst. That's yeah. the whole point of the whole enchilada. Yes. Wow. Well, let's take a break and when we get back, let's, uh, let's, have me be triggered by something else. <laughs> All right, we're back from the break. I want to highlight some patrons of the podcast because they're our favorite people. We have, uh, let's see, I want to start from the, the, the $10 people. We got 
Erica and Kristen woo, woo. and Caitlin and Kylie Yay. and Renee and Hallie. We know Hallie. We karaoke with Hallie the other day. Karaoke, indeed. We got Lyndon, which, of course, we know Lyndon well. FPL. We got David. Actually, you know David. He's a student who you met at one of our live podcasts. That's right. We have Cassandra and Lucia and Lauren and, and Beth. Yay. And Daniel. And Well, Daniel hasn't updated his credit card. So it's just a little uh, thing here is sometimes your credit card gets declined and you don't know it. So you have to go to patreon.com to kind of make sure your credit card, like if you change your credit card or you lose your credit mm, card or something. Yes, this happens to me all the time. Yeah, so like Yolanda, if you're listening out there, your, your credit card has been declined. Let me just sort of humiliate people. Uh, Megan, Yvonne, Jackie. Uh, Update your credit card. Yeah, Adi, your, your, your credit card is, has been declined. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 I, I've talked with some people about this because they're like, how come I don't have access to Patreon, Patreon, Patreon anymore? And then I look and I'm like, oh, it might be because you change your credit card, and you know, because like if when you lose your credit card, you cancel yeah. and you get a new credit card with a new number, and then That's, all you, this is what I do all the time. Yeah, and all the time I am getting some emails saying your account is going to get canceled, and I'm like, what are you talking about? You're right. I'm like, God, that's right. I got to update the thing. So become a patron of the podcast, please. Okay. So let's talk about the Prey on Predator Squad or the Pop Squad. Have you heard about this, Berto? I hadn't. You told me about it uh, in preparation for this and I looked it up. I mean, I had heard about the idea and certainly the show with, uh, what was it? Uh, to Catch a Predator. Right. To Catch a Predator. Right. We've heard of those ones, but now there are people who are doing it freelance right. on YouTube. Right. And so... So I watched a, a couple of videos and it was uh, fascinating, actually. Yeah. Just the idea that... And they don't blur out the guy's face. No, no. It's very... So I, I had I had multiple thoughts about it, actually. Yeah. So to, to describe to people what they do is they will do... I, I believe they'll do chat with... And they'll get like a fake picture and stuff. Yeah. And it's men. It's always men that are doing it, by the way. And they go into chat rooms and they're, they're, they're trying to find some, uh, some sexual predator who's looking for a, a child to have sex yeah. with. And so they'll pose as a 12-year-old girl. They'll send pictures. They'll talk about sexual things. And then they'll say, let's meet up. Similar to, to Catch a Predator. But right. instead of telling them to come to a house, they just say, let's meet at the 7-Eleven. Right. Or, let's meet at this you know, corner or something. And then the guy shows up with his phone and he's recording. And then he's just like, oh, you know, are you so-and-so? And the guy will be like, uh, yeah. yeah. And he's like, and then he just immediately just starts, you know, laying into the guy. Right. Like, you wanted to have sex. I have it right here. You wanted to have sex with a 12-year-old. And how dare you? And what's right. wrong with you? And the guy will be like, what's going on? And and then like other, and so there's, there's actually a number of outfits that do this on YouTube because it gets a lot of hits. Right. And the one that I sent you was these guys who actually will strong arm these people. This was in England. Right. Yeah. Where they'll actually, I don't know how they get away with this legally, but the, a guy will be like... Um, take uh, your hands out of your pockets. Yeah, take your hands We'll out take of, your hands out of your pockets for you. Yeah, if you don't take your hands out of our pockets, we're gonna re, I'm going to restrain you. And these aren't yeah. police officers. No. Nope. These are just citizens. Yep. And and then they proceed to humiliate and follow right. these people around and you know and real and then they post it on the internet with right. with their name by the way or their you know their screen name or something right 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 and so that's what we're looking at yeah so I mean on the one hand of course I am thrilled that uh, these people are getting stopped from hurting little ones that is very very important and awesome uh, there are some flip sides in my mind. I, overall, I think I net out on like, yeah, this seems like some version of these of this seems useful. I do think there are some risks. Uh, things could turn violent. Uh, the wrong people could be targeted. Um, there, there could be, and I realize that this is a common excuse, but there could be some misunderstandings. Uh, and the uh, the other thing is, um, you know, let's say let's say it's uh, there's been these cases where. It's a 17 year old and uh, and a 15 year old, right? And it's like technically, uh, in some places, it'd be statutory rape or whatever. Um, but it's not, you know, it's it's not quite the same as 
someone online hunting around for a 12 year old or something like that. But uh, that's not what they're doing. No, I, in this case, they're not. But I'm saying like mob justice doesn't always work out well. Yeah. You know, totally. That's part of it. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, the idea of like, hey, we're going to try to out people and then turn them into the authorities with evidence. As long as it's legal, which I guess in some places maybe it isn't, but I, I think in general that's good. It can, it could turn violent, right? Like these people could show up and the, the person could have a gun or or they could decide to take matters into their own hands. And so that that gives me a little bit of pause. Um, certainly the, there's that part of me that goes like, ah, screw them, yes, burn them all, but... Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So this is for a patron, Brandon, because he actually wanted us to talk about this and because he is one, he's like, well, um, it seems like I... I like it, but at the same time, I, after listening to some of your other podcasts in which you talk about pedophiles, I'm wondering what your take is on it. On it. Yeah. And so, so here's my take on it, which is um, basically the same as what you're saying, Berto, which is that, so, so there, are some, there are some good things about it, you know, that it is, uh, you know, it's criminal for a man to... Or a woman. <laughs> yeah, for anybody, yeah. right? It's, it's, it's criminal for anybody to uh, proposition one, and then take behaviors to, you know, make it happen to have a sexual encounter with a minor. Yeah. yeah. Uh, especially when you're, you know, if you're 17, it's like you're edging into yeah, age yeah, of yeah. consent. But if you're talking about a 12-year-old, it's like pretty... Yeah, right. And, and in, this, in this case, that example you're talking about, the guy was like 43. Yeah. And the girl would have been 12. Yeah. But even if the guy was 20 years old, it's, sure. it's still criminal and, and wrong and yeah, harmful yeah. and just... Not anything I'm going to get behind. Right. And so you have someone who is is being prevented from doing that. They're being outed. They are probably going to think twice about doing it again. And people watching it are going to think twice about, about pursuing that line of behavior, which is, uh, yeah, I get, you know, it's, it's a wonderful thing. That, yeah. that That's a wonderful public service that these YouTube channels are doing. Um, on the other hand, what it what it could do is an overall bad thing, which I'll get into in a second. Because really, the the larger question here, I think what we're asking is, what are we doing to reduce the victimization of children? Because that's what this, you know, if this video... Right. That's that's why people feel good when they watch this video. Is yeah. They're like, okay, this video, at least in some small way, or maybe even big ways is stopping the victimization of children. But it would be, it would seem like it would be more effective, even with the whole To Catch a Predator show, to not have a show, not have the YouTube channel, still go through the same steps and turn these people into the police. Because when you do it that way, no one knows that this is out there. And so you, you would imagine you'd catch a lot more people. Because as soon as you put this video out there, well, now there's people on the on on the lookout for this kind of thing, and so you think, well, great. So then they're not going to pick up. No, they're just going to be more careful, and they're going to maybe avoid certain sites, and they're going to yeah, yeah, maybe. Um, but the overall thing that I'm uh, hoping everyone's concerned about is not let's make let's make uh, predators suffer, but let's stop children from being yeah. victimized. And so uh, we have to look at what are we doing in our society, in our American society, to reduce the victimization of children? What, what are some things that we're doing that are, that are working? Oh, that are working? I don't know. <laughs> well, we have Child Protective Services, okay. which is there, which is very... Does it work? It, yeah, absolutely it works. Okay. My, uh, my impression of CPS is that... It, it, that's because of, it's because I don't have data, it. right? But it seems like when people need it, it's not there, and when they don't need it, it's there. <laughs> no, it's there. Um, it's it's underfunded okay. and underteethed in a lot of ways, mm. and the people are pretty stressed out and and um, burnt out mm. because of they don't get paid enough. But uh, absolutely, CPS has saved you know hundreds of thousands of lives and millions of children from, from, from being hurt and the threat of CPS. Right. right. Okay. So uh, not to say that there aren't abuses. I've done a whole episode about problems with the CPS called like a child, or maybe I just called it child protective services. Anyway, um, we have laws on the books, you know, adequate, yeah. we have adequate reactions to perpetrators that, you know, is supposed to 
put people behind bars, make ma- treatment mandatory, also be a deterrent to people who might do it. We also have mandated reporting laws for professionals to report these kinds of things. Right. Uh, there's some awareness campaigns, not a lot. There's, there's some, registers, right? Public. Yeah. There, yeah. So that's part of the law. Um, there's some talk in the media about sexual abuse to mm-hmm. try to help you know people out. There's some there's some talk with children in schools and these sorts of places. There's a lot of research. There's pretty good therapist training, I would say. It could be better, but therapists and counselors are trained on how to detect it, how to treat it. There's some teacher training, probably not as much as there should be. There's programs like Dawson Place in in Everett or Linwood, Washington, which is a office that houses CPS workers, therapists, mm-hmm. family therapists, police officers, child advocates, and law people, and they all work in the same office. And when there's a kid who has been, you know, alleged to have been sexually abused, then this whole office collaboratively works together as a team mm. to not, to help the child, help the family, and prosecute the perpetrator. Wow. So that everyone's not working in different directions, which it's a really wonderful model. Unless they're Catholic priests. Yeah. <laughs> and the, uh, the, the benefit is that you don't have people pulling in different directions and there's not a lack of communication. Uh, the downside to these offices is that everyone's uh, secondary traumatized all the time. Oh, of, man. Because every client they work with is sure. a child who's been sexually abused, usually by oh. their parent. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, that, that would be so troubling. Yeah. And also our society is doing vigilante uh, sting operations, which is which yeah. are deterrence, which you could say, you know, probably has a good effect on, on on deterring people from doing it. I guess I would hope that these would be, for example, nonprofit enterprises that donate the money to the same causes rather than YouTube channels trying to get as many views as possible. I don't know. Uh, I doubt it. <laughs> I mean, maybe, but... Uh, well, because that seems... That seems very uh, but, unethical. But, you know, uh, to catch a predator, they they, right. s- they sold... Right, and I, I feel like that's unethical, too. Right. They, yeah. they made money from, from that, and yeah. um, I don't think it's unethical. I think it it's a similar... Th- I mean, it seems wrong in a sense, but, um, but to create entertaining slash justice, um, you know, it's a similar thing where people do... Uh, investigative journalism on like a um, like a ju- there's this one judge who was like going golfing all day long and not doing his job and this this journalist like followed him around and like humiliated him and and, yeah. and he made he made money off of it and I mm-hmm. I f- if if we're gonna have journalists who have the resources to actually pursue these things then money has to be involved we can't just say you're gonna yeah you can do no justice oriented journalism and make money off of it. That's just that's just not a good model. I, I'm not saying pass laws about it. I'm just I'm just questioning if cuz how are you going to get more hits is by humiliating the people more, making those moments even more stressful. Well, okay, the, so 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 that's why I think there's there's definitely a bad side of this and so let me list those things out. I mean, the bad things in our society is that it's clear we're still in the dark ages about this sort of thing because the vast majority of victims don't feel comfortable reporting the incidents to anybody, not only the police, but they don't even feel comfortable telling their best friend or their parents or their siblings or their diary or someone on, they can't, they can't tell anybody that they were sexually abused. And that's because of us, we've created a society where it, it feels really bad it, it, they predict very bad things will happen to them if they come forward. Whereas yeah. if, like I've done other analogies, if you have a five-year-old who gets punched in the face by an eight-year-old at school, uh, in general, they feel pretty comfortable going to the teacher or their parents saying, I got punched in the face today. Right. Uh, but, if, but if they get fondled by a teacher or an uncle or something like right. we have a society where those children feel like they can't step forward. Yeah. And p- part of it is so, it's hard with to imagine how, and I'm sure that you have uh, recommendations, but it's hard to imagine how you talk to kids be, below a certain age about something where as soon as you start talking about it, so many questions will come up. And then you wonder, at what point am I 
inundating their mind with things that are actually going to confuse them. <laughs> just, uh, as I always say, just swap out violence. So if, if you are talking to your five-year-old about uh, ethics and violence... And, and, you're, and you're like, so little Johnny, if you're on the playground and I'm not around and another kid comes up to you or an adult and puts hands on you and you don't want hands and, and you don't want them to put hands on you or they punch you or they throw a rock at you or they threaten to hurt you, uh, that's wrong. And, you know, you don't have to go through that's scary and it's wrong. And you can tell me right away and I will do so or you just scream. Just scream, someone's trying to hurt me. <laughs> you have that right. Like, we don't have a problem saying that to a five-year-old, right? Because, but because pain is obvious, right? But, okay, but so is uh, sexual confusion or touching confusion. So, right. little Johnny, if anyone comes up to you and says that they want to they touch, it's a little subtler, right? Because That's what I'm saying. Like, what, why would they, why do they want to touch me there? That you say, they, they are, there's, you know, what if they asked you, why would someone want to punch me in the head? Well, sure, but... <laughs> well, what would your answer be? Well, you could say, like, because they're angry at you because you took their ball, right? Like, or, but you don't know that. No, I know, but you're making examples. Like, you're just giving but an example. Some people target children with violence for no reason. Do you sure, know I mean? sure, but, but you can give examples that they can relate to fairly easily about cases where someone might get aggressive. Well, okay. So I guess it gets a little muddier, but it's but the point is is that parents do it all the time and they're Yeah, who do it, it just seems up. challenging. <laughs> it, 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 well, let me put it a different way. It's only challenging. We have not been educated how to do it. Right. It's it, only it's only challenging if you're ashamed of the conversation is the point. And if you are worried that you're going to say something that is going to infect a child's mind with sexuality and newsflash they already have sexual thoughts in their heads yeah, but, anyway. But the new, that news flash hasn't reached anyone. One, number two, no one goes through this training. Right. That's my point. Yeah. That, that's my whole point here. Yeah, it's yeah. like you, ju you asked me, how do you talk to a five-year-old <laughs> right. about these things? And I say, it, it's, it's very similar to a conversation yeah. you would have with I guess, about I, and, and I knew you were going to have some good answer. I meant somewhat like pointing out the fact that how does one do Like no one knows how to do this. I see. Yeah. Um, Right. So we have a problem. And if we are really concerned about victimization of children, then that is what we have to attack. I mean, there is something wrong. There's something rotten in Denmark, and it's been there for over 100 years at least. And we have so many symptoms because of the rottenness in our Victorian sexuality attitudes in our society. And it's affecting children. It's resulting in children not being able to feel, all adults, adults and children, not feeling like they can even tell their best friend that they were raped. That's a problem. And, uh, and if all we do is like uh, attack people on YouTube and do these sting operations of vigilante style, then we are far from fixing the problem. Right. Uh, the other thing is that when you make videos like this, that it, it could further stigmatize perpetrators, which they are already stigmatized up the yin yang. Right. <laughs> like we don't need any more stigmatizing of sexual uh, uh, um, of predators and right. sexual assault people. This is what I was what I was saying is that like you drive them further underground. Right. So so right now. Uh, they either never or almost never seek treatment for their problem. And the more stigmatizing of them means they'll be even less likely to come forward for like, help. Like, imagine a different approach to the same video. So, you know, the, the person is sitting here and the people are approaching them. And they're like, hey, dude, I caught you. Uh, is I just want to say, uh, have you ever thought about trying to stop? Have you ever thought about getting treatment for that? Yeah, I, I was going to go even further. Like, hey, you know, like, can I give you a hug? <laughs> you know, can, can we just, can, can we talk through this? Yeah. And, and like show pictures, try to empathize, try to get them to empathize. Well, and no, say like, it's, it's treatment you know, is what they need. Yeah, yeah, right. But in, I'm just saying in the moment, try to get them to feel like, hey, we're not trying to demonize you, we're try but we are trying to protect our little ones. I like that. So, right, um, you know, we are... We're getting worse, actually, with this sort of thing. Right. Like, I did an episode recently about how we are, uh, in some instances, as therapists, we are mandated to report if our clients tell us that they downloaded child porn onto their computer. Mm. And, 
because you know it's illegal. Well, they're not going to tell you. That's for sure. <laughs> well, but if let's say right, and so let's right. if someone wanted help, so we have this vast uh, general, mostly uh, uh, universal commitment to to privacy and confidentiality. Right. You know, a client tells me they robbed a bank yesterday. Can't report it. Right. Client tells me they killed someone yesterday. Can't. Re- can't report it, don't want to report it. Right. Because I want them to talk with me about their issues. If I'm going to help them not kill someone in the future, I, right. can't, I can't be a fucking tattletale to the police. But when it comes to child porn, right. they pass a law in California that said right. therapists are mandated to report it. It's like, Man. it's like, how are we supposed to help these people? Yeah. Um, I get that you are worried about kids, but we're going in the wrong direction. Yeah, yeah, because... So, so one assumption, and I certainly have felt like this before, right, is... The the implicit assumption is these people should know know better and should know better. So so you imagine them sitting there at home, going ha 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 today I know better and I know that I shouldn't and actually can stop myself. But instead I'm gonna go abuse some children. Exactly. Now some people are like that. <laughs> the majority are not. Right. And so it's sad because the 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 flip side is they might actually be sitting there going, oh gosh I wish I. I wish I didn't do this, but I got to, I just got this desire and they're not even having a literal conversation and they just reoffend and they reoffend and they hurt and they hurt and they hurt both themselves and they hurt lots of people. Yeah. And Has you're this right. attitude changed in you since I first met you? Probably. Cause I'm I sure. feel like, I mean, we've known each other for, for a decade, <laughs> but I mean, even since the, we'd started really getting this in the podcast, cause I, I, as you were saying this, it's music to my ears, but I'm surprised that you're saying it because I feel like five years ago or three years ago, you wouldn't have articulated it in that way. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that happened to me as a result of losing my religion um, was sort of like analyzing humans a little bit more empathetically as animals, <laughs> you know, like, oh, I see that's what like before the see. podcast. Well, no, it's, it's been a slow progress that started right around the time a little bit before I met you, and it's taken me a long time. So there's things that have percolated slower, and I think this is probably one of them because I do instinctively feel like, I, and, and, and don't get me wrong, there are some monsters out there yeah. that need to get instantly stopped at all costs. Yeah. But they're uh, rare. Isn't but they're it? rare. And so there's a lot of people that... Man, they're definitely abusive and they need to stop and they're hurting kids. But they, they, but oh, let's say it this way. If our goal, like you were saying, if our goal is to minimize how many kids get hurt, our, the process we follow is critical. Right. Yeah. And we can follow a process that leads to underground, uh, making these people more marginalized, more underground, and therefore they will continue to offend maybe even more so. And maybe it'll be harder to find them. Right. And yeah. Right. We can follow the path that we're on now, right. which isn't reducing the victimization of children. Right. Or we can try something that actually works to help reach out to these people right. and, and convince them or help them to not do it. You know, it's similar, and I, I don't want to rat hole on these, but it's similar to like drug conversations or even rape, uh, sorry, rape, shit, uh, abortion conversations. Yeah. Where, so, you know, there's this assumption like, oh, you want abortions. Like, no, who really wants abortions as like a fun thing we're all going to do? Yeah. But then you look at the data and you're like, oh man, this is such a terrible thing when this happens. Same thing with drugs. I, do I really want like people g- killing themselves with heroin? Yeah, that, that <laughs> those are great examples. I'll drill down on the abortion one. When you are in a state or a community who is very religious and doesn't like abortion, you're also against uh, premarital sex, right? And you're also against talking about condoms and right. talk, talking about birth control. It's the perfect storm, right? And so what you end up doing is, uh, and your your uh, your general approach is, well, we're just going to stigmatize the fuck out of fucking abstinence only. Yeah, we're just going to make people who have sex are sinners. Right. People who want sex are sinners, and and I will just try to eradicate sex <laughs> right. by stigmatizing it uh, instead of reaching out to the people who want to have sex p- before marriage right. and saying like, how can we work with you so that we can minimize any damage that you get right. out of this, you know? Uh, and so so the the horny sixteen year old boys and girls become more and more stigmatized, more right. and more. Uh, closeted, more and more 
internalized upsetness, more and more marginalized, more and more quiet, more and more uh, uh, desperate for some kind of outlet because no one is listening, no one's helping. Right. And so they they end up just having random sex one and night. And get pregnant. <laughs> and they get pregnant because th- they weren't planning. Right. You know? And so when, the same goes for pedophiles. If they right. can plan, if they have support, they can, there's not all of them, but many of them can actually live a lifestyle in which they don't harm anybody. Dude, this is true for alcoholics. This is, tr- oh, and this is, this kind of approach is true in so many uh, ways that we've even talked about in other shows. So take, uh, let's say I, I hate the fact that you are uh, killing animals for, for food, right? And so I show up to your house and I throw pig's blood in your face. Is that going to help? By the way, since the uh, <laughs> vegan episode came out uh, recently, I haven't had any uh, animal. Well, no, I had an egg. Okay. <gasps> Murder! <laughs> no, but you see what I'm saying? Like, it's the same kind of thing where, where. But it's not funny that that I've been keeping track. I was like, <laughs> yeah, oh. that is funny. Yeah, yeah. So as soon as you make these extreme all or nothings, right? Like starting tomorrow, because you just heard what I told you. Starting tomorrow, you have to completely change your life and never reoffend. Right. That's not human. That's not, unfortunately, how the universe works. Right. It's not, and it's, it's not effective. It's not effective. It's not effective. And what we're doing it's not effective. with sexual abuse in our, in our society, there's some good things, but it's not, it's clearly not working. We, right. Like something like half of people are sexually abused at some point in their life. <laughs> right. It's like this, this, I hear this talking point a lot on the, on the, some right wing uh, silos, uh, inner city in in Detroit and stuff like you you want to talk about black violence look at all the black people killing each other and it's like okay yeah there's a lot now what's your point with that how how are you going to solve that one oh they just need to stop it oh i see right so stop it stop doing that (laughs) that's what that's what's going to solve it yeah yeah like you're not going to look at root cause or what's trigger and that's a similar thing with so many of these problems right it's this um moralistic i think is the philosophical yeah. term that describes this way of thinking which is there are evil people or evil evil deeds and possibly evil people and we all have control and awareness right <laughs> and there are good people and good deeds and we need to uh, talk about it in that way and we have to reject the evilness and not try to dialogue with it or help it or anything like that which you know, anyway, so yeah. so these videos, uh, patron uh, Brandon is asking, you know, about these videos. Um, so on one hand, I would say that, yeah, they might be raising an aware, they might be raising awareness in general of sexual abuse because they're really, right. they're really popular on YouTube. And so it's possible that some, some, some kid might come across this video True. and be like, huh, so that's what a sexual predator looks like? That kind of looks like my uncle, right? Or that looks my looks like my aunt. And maybe I'll be more aware online because it seems like there's these people online, or right? Something. So, 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 so maybe there's some good from that, yeah. And and maybe just good, you know, because a lot of people are going, huh? There are predators among us. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, but like I said, it might be further. It is further stigmatizing people, or you know, the other the other flip to this is it might actually not be stigma. It might actually be reducing stigma. For these people, because these these predators that they catch, similar to you know catch a predator, they look so pathetic. They don't look like the boogeyman. They just look like dorks. They often look really dorky. Yeah, you know, and they're they're deer in headlights. You know, they're just like, what yeah. is happening? They and they they're often very nonviolent, and some of them are really apologetic. You yeah. know, and they're they cry. Yeah. And so it's possible that these videos done in a particular way might actually humanize some of these people. Oh, I will say, so to catch a predator, I wasn't, I wouldn't say it was super empathetic, but at least because it was a show and it was all these things, there was never any like, Hey, you asshole, come here. You, but you know, it was never like that. Right. It's like, come take a seat, please. Well, it Sir, was take a seat. purposefully humiliating. You know but, what I mean? Like yeah, if they were truly to catch a predator, uh, the p- 
police would just handcuff him and they wouldn't film it. Well, this is what I was saying, you bastard. You're taking my point. <laughs> but what I'm, but I, I'm, I'm giving them a little bit of credit in that the guy, what, whatever is it, Chris Wallace or something? Chris? I don't remember. He wasn't like in their face yelling at them and like, you see what I'm saying? Like he was like, take a seat, sir. Yeah. yeah. What were you doing? The YouTube video I did see was way more in, in the guy's yeah, face. Definitely down yeah. that spectrum for sure. And granted, that is the impulse a lot of people would have and probably why those videos are probably more popular. And it's very satisfying to right. the moralistic, like, yeah, get them. Right, moralistic notion of, of revenge. And this is true even for, so take racist people, right? Like a lot of people that are not racist or of the race that is being affected, the instinct is to be like, get in their face and be like, you racist motherfucker, you gotta stop, right? Right. But they're never gonna change that way. No. No, exactly. In terms of, you know, that, that whole thing, but yeah. So I guess my final word is, I don't, similar, similar to how, you know, the notion that veganism is going to change the world or, you know, help the world is, uh, if that's all we're doing, then we're doomed. And so if these, vi if these videos are all that we're doing as a society or as a YouTube community, <laughs> like the last stop, the last gap, yeah. or sorry, the last resort. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Then that's pretty sad, you know. There, there are so many other things. Like, like how many? I'm just trying to think of other videos that could be being made on YouTube. Like, a video showing how to talk with your kid about uh, avoiding right. sexual abuse. Like, right. how many hits do videos like that get? Right. How many videos even get made along those lines? Or, like I was saying, like a convers, a real conversations with people that have those feelings, and talking empathetically to them about it. About, right. about it. How many? How you know? how many uh, heroes do we have of pedophiles who are refraining from having sex with children? Right. I mean, how many, how many heroes do we have like right. that? Uh, none. And uh, the notion of such a thing is ridiculous um, in, in our society. Right. And so uh, if that, if this is, so I, what I, I, my, again, I think the videos are, are probably on the borderline between fine and not fine. But we need to be doing so many other things. Yeah. Uh, any final words, Berto? Yeah, I, I think that overall, am I glad that a video or, or many of those videos could be stopping real abuse from happening to real kids? Oh, of course. Billion percent. Uh, but I totally agree with you that at the very least, it can't be the only approach we're taking. Yeah. And there may be cases where we actually want to change even how those videos are presented or how we treat those quote unquote perpetrators. Yeah. Maybe at the end, if they have like a, or at the beginning and end, they have a public service announcement about like what we can all do. Yeah. Uh, then, uh, and, or what pedophiles who are trying to get treatment can do, you right. know, then, um, that would be good. All right. Well, that does it for that episode of psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining us out there. Please take care of yourself because you deserve it. Mm -hmm.